Okay, so let's talk through an example of a dynamic discrete choice model. Our example here is going to be to try to answer the question or, or, or relate to the question, why do people attend college? Or maybe more relevant to some of you, why do people uh, choose to attend graduate school? Is it because the four years that you spend in college provide more utility than anything else that you or another individual could have been doing in those four years? Is it kind of within those four years, is college really the utility maximizing choice? Or is it the case that going to college opens up a new set of jobs and higher salaries compared to not attending college? If you wanna think about from this grad school perspective, are you really enjoying grad school so much that this is the utility, utility maximizing choice you could, be, you could have right now instead of a job or anything else you could be doing with your life? Or is this going to, having a PhD or a master's degree, is that gonna open up new jobs, better jobs, higher salaries, uh, you know, kind of a, a higher quality of life for you in the future? It might be both, but certainly the latter is part of the decision-making process that led you to attend grad school. So a static model is only going to look at the current time period and is going to implicitly assume that the first answer is correct. That if we see people going to college, every one of those people must get more utility from college than anything else they could be doing in those four years. It's not going to represent, in really a good way, it's not going to be able to re represent the fact that going to college might change your future choice set and change salaries, change maybe just the quality of job that you can get in the future. If we want to add that to our model, we're going to need to use a dynamic discrete choice model to explicitly represent how the decision to attend college affects future choice sets, salaries, utilities, all of that. And so let's start, uh, let's get a little, uh, you know, mathy or, or model uh, based here to, to say this more formally. Let's think about a decision maker, thinking about either going to college or work at first, or we're gonna think about having actual, actually two time periods that they're thinking about. First, they think about, do I wanna to go to college or work for, for four years? They go to college in the first period, they're gonna get utility U1C, utility in the first period from going to college. We can think about there being like an N subscript on all of this also, but there's gonna be so much notation, I'm just leaving it out. But we can think about this as applying to a single person and, and it could be different for different people. So utility in the first period from going to college. And then the, if they went to work instead for four years, they'd get some utility from that. They'd get the utility of the first period from working. After those four years are up, then they're going to go, if they went to college, they're going to go take a job. If they were working, maybe they'll think about a different job or, you know, now they have a little more experience. So, so maybe there are just some different jobs available to them. So in the second period, they're going to have a set of capital J possible jobs that will they'll think about for a career over many future years. If they took job J after attending college, then in period two, they will receive utility 2JC. If after working in period one, they take job J in period two, then they will get in period two utility U2JW. But really this person is sitting here before they've even decided whether to go to college or, or to work and trying to decide which one do I wanna do. And so they're gonna think about the fact that going to college or working is gonna give them some different amount of utility for four years. And then after they've done that, there's going to be a new choice made over what job to take. And that choice will differ depending on whether they go to college or whether they work. And so from the beginning of this whole process, you could think about them wanting to calculate what is the total amount of utility I'm going to get from going to college? What is the total amount of utility I'm going to get from working? Where they take into consideration the fact that their kind of later in life utility could be very different depending on these two choices. And so we're going to say the total utility of college is the actual utility they get from going to college in period one, plus the second term here. 
the lambda term in front is going to be essentially like a weighting between our two periods. How much do they weight the, the future career versus these first four years? There's going to be some discounting there, but if the length of the time periods are different, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult to know exactly how we weight these things, but there will be some weighting. And then it's going to be the maximum over J. So we're going to think that when they get to this second period, they're going to choose the job that maximizes their utility, conditional on having gone to college. And so the utility they get in the second period after going to college is the utility from the, 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 the utility from the utility maximizing job. So that's kind of what this notation means here. When they get to the second period, they choose the optimal job that maximizes utility. This tells us how much utility that would be. We weight it by lambda and add it up to the utility in the first period. And similarly for, for working, uh, you know, they'll, 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 they'll get some utility in the first period from working, and then they'll get some utility from jobs in the second period after working. Importantly, these second periods though are different, right? Each job will give them a different utility in the second period depending on whether they went to college or not. In particular, there will probably just be more jobs in this, in the kind of college choice set than in the didn't go to college choice set. And so it's the second period that'll be very different uh, in addition to the first period being different. And so we can think about a rational decision maker looking at all of these future utilities and calculating what would be my utility from going to college? What would be my utility from working? And they're going to attend college if and only if that total utility of going to college is greater than the total utility of working. This is like a binary choice. We've just added this extra dimensionality to it where we also have to take into consideration this kind of multinomial choice in the second period of, of, of jobs. Now, the way we, the econometricians, are going to deal with this is think about decomposing utility in each period uh, you know, into an observed and an unobserved component, just like we did before. And again, when we're talking about unobserved here, I mean unobserved to the econometrician. For now, let's think about the, the, the actual decision maker knowing what their utility would be. We just don't observe it. So for each one of these utilities, we have a, an observed component V that we're going to be able to model and an unobserved component epsilon that we're going to have to treat as random. And so let's define this kind of epsilon vector as being all of the epsilons. So epsilon 1c, epsilon 1w, and all of the epsilon 2j's and c's and all of the epsilon 2jw's. So there's going to be tons of stuff in this one big epsilon vector that has joint density uh, defined by f, uh, uh, by, by f. And so we can write down the probability that the decision maker chooses to attend college. It's just going to be the probability that total utility of college is greater than the total utility of working. We had expressions for both of these on, the, on a previous slide. We could plug those in. We also had expressions for u where we decompose that. We can plug those in. And what we end up with is this big thing here, where it's going to be a function of observed and unobserved utilities in both time periods for both period one choices and all possible period two choices, uh, which one of those is greater integrated over our density of epsilon. We're gonna have to simulate this thing. Yeah, that might be obvious to you. It's pretty complicated. We're gonna have to simulate it uh, just as we did with, with a mixed logit model, uh, you know, just because um, uh, we're not going to be, because we have this second time period, because we have two different sets of epsilons floating around, one of which is inside this maximization term, things just aren't going to be able to simplify in the way they did with a logit model. And so we're going to have to approximate this integral using numerical simulation. We can make a simplification to make it easier on us. If we assume that random utility in the first period, the epsilon 1c and the epsilon 1w, that those are IID extreme value. So kind of make the logit assumption in the first period. We get something a little simpler. Uh, we get this expression here, which I think you can see, it's just kind of like everything but that first period epsilon goes up here. And so it's a, basically a load, uh, you know, it, it looks like a, a logit model for the first period, but then there's this extra complicating piece for the second period. 
Now, all we need to make assumptions about are the density or is the density of epsilons in the second period. So there's just kind of less that we have to make assumptions about and less that we have to simulate over, but we still have to simulate this integral. And the reason we have to do this, the reason we have to simulate, the reason it doesn't simplify down is because we have this epsilon term here. We're going to choose, even if we know, even if we condition on choosing college in the first period, we don't know with certainty what they're going to choose in the second period because there's this unobserved utility that the decision maker will get from all of their different jobs. We don't know what that is. We don't know which choice they will make in the second period. And so we can't kind of explicitly represent this term with just kind of like a known utility value. We have to use this kind of unknown utility value. Um, and so things just don't simplify in the way that they did for the simple logit model. We can make another simplifying assumption uh, and assume that random utility in the second period is also IID extreme value. So then our second period becomes uh, just a, a basic logit model. And so then we can actually define the choice probability that someone chooses college in the first period and then any particular job in the second period. We could also do the opposite and do work in the first period. But then this is going to be this choice probability up here times the simple logit choice probability in the second period. Once again, this all just comes down to the fact that there's going to be that the choice made in the first period is going to depend on what choice will be made in the second period. And we don't know everything that's going into that decision making process. And that is what adds an extra layer of complication to this for us as the econometricians. We can think about expanding to even more time periods, uh, a third time period. Uh, this get, video is getting a little long, so I'm going to try to go quickly here. But let's, let's add a third time period. After a person works, now they've reached the retirement age, and they can either choose to keep working, uh, work part time and spend some of their retirement funds, or maybe even retire, collect Social Security, pension, whatever. Well, let's also suppose, I mean, re realistically, that the retirement plan, social security payout, whatever, is going to differ depending on which job someone has in the second period. So when this decision maker is in period two, uh, trying to decide what job to take, they're going to think not just about how much utility do they get in period two, but also how will this how will the job that I take in period two affect my retirement choice and the utility I get in period three. Then in period one, the decision maker is going to think about not just do I like college or, or work better, but how does that affect the jobs available to me? And how do those jobs available to me affect my retirement plans? So it's kind of in period one, they're going to actually think about their entire full future that's in front of them when thinking about whether to go to college or work, all three time periods. And so we can add a third time period here. I'm not going to belabor the point. We're going to add an extra, a U3 that's going to depend on both the first period choice and the second period choice. That adds an extra term to our total utility. So now we've kind of got three, like three nested uh, utility terms here. Uh, or three additive utility terms, I guess, but we kind of have these maximizations happening multiple times that are that are nested. We can decompose yet again to have an epsilon, a v and an epsilon for each one of these. So now we have an, an another dimension of epsilons to think about. You can see we're just getting kind of as we as we add time periods, as we as we kind of add more realism to how this decision might actually be made, we're just adding more and more complexity. We could write down the choice probabilities here. Um, as, as they just keep getting a little messier and a little more difficult to deal with, but we could write down these choice probabilities, make some assumptions about how all of our epsilons, the epsilons for for both college and work and for every job and for every retirement plan, conditional on everything that's happened in the past, we can make assumptions about those epsilons and then simulate these choice probabilities. And I didn't say it before, but obviously we need these choice probabilities just as we have in all of our discrete choice models, because that's what we're gonna use. We're essentially gonna try to find the parameters that, that make uh, 
choice probabilities kind of in line with the actual observed choices that we see. So I, I went kind of quickly through this three period dynamics, but you can see here that things get things get kind of, uh, well, the problem can just kind of explode quickly as we keep adding time periods to our dynamics, which makes dynamics uh, kind of just inherently kind of computationally and even kind of theoretically difficult problem to think about because everything that happens uh, today depends on everything that's happened in the past. And if that's the case, then when people are making decisions in the past, they're going to think about all future time periods and we're going to want to represent that in our model. In the, the, the next video, I'm going to say this kind of more generally, not in a specific example, but just kind of talk through the math of discrete choice dynamic discrete cho choice models uh, more generally and, and formally than we just did in that example.